So, I'm angry this morning. i tell you what I'm angry with. I'm angry with death. I hate death. Every person that was closest to me as a boy growing up, every family relation I had, those closest to me, <clears throat> have all died. Friends that I've had in my lifetime, not part of the church, had many of those die. Friends inside this church who I've loved, they've died. And add to that all of you, as I look around the room, so many of you in this room, you know, have lost loved ones, seen your, your grief, your pain. I hate death. But you know, so did Jesus. Jesus knows death more than anyone. He knows about its consequences far, far more than we do. And we're going to see this morning that he reacts towards this viscerally, passionately. Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 1.26 that death is the last enemy, but praise God, this last enemy has been defeated by Jesus Christ. Amen? In John chapter 11 is the account of Jesus raising Lazarus from the dead. And in John chapter 11, verse 25, Jesus says this. We saw this a couple of weeks ago. He says to, to Martha, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me shall live even if he dies, and everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. So Jesus speaks these words, but today he doesn't just say words. He's going to demonstrate that he indeed has the power over death. He indeed has conquered death. We've been looking at the series, The Words and Works of Jesus from the Gospel of John, the words, the, the seven I am statements that Jesus makes. We've looked at five so far. <clears throat> I am the bread of life. I'm the light of the world. I'm the door. I'm the good shepherd. Uh, I am the resurrection and the life. And he equates himself with, with uh, Jehovah God of the Old Testament, with his redemptive work and why he came. And there's also seven signs or seven miracles that Jesus performs in the Gospel of John. We've looked at six. Today we're going to look at the seventh uh, and maybe the most dramatic of all. John writes this in John chapter 20, verse 30. Therefore, many other signs Jesus also performed in the presence of the disciples. Signs, miracles, which are not written in this book. But these have been written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing that you may have life in his name. Many, many miracles Jesus performed. Who knows how many? John's going to record seven. Like I said, today will be the last one that he performs. And today we're going to look at death, the last enemy, part two. Part one was when we looked at the first part of John, John 11, 1 to 20. Uh, six, today we're going to look at John 1, 27 through 44. And seven people have been raised, were raised from the dead that the scripture records. The Old Testament prophets Elijah and Elisha each raised the person from the dead. Peter and Paul each raised the person from the dead. Jesus recorded, we have three. The, the widow of Nain's son, he raised from the dead. Jarius' daughter, he raised from the dead. And today we're going to see Lazarus. That's three recorded. There might have been many more. We don't know. So to bring, to bring us where we are today, Jesus and his disciples had been in Judea. They left. Judea is where Jerusalem is. They left Judea. And a message comes to them <clears throat> that Lazarus had died. Lazarus was the brother of Martha and Mary, and Jesus loved this family. He was particularly close to this family. And so as they tell Jesus this, he's like, okay, and does nothing. Matter of fact, he waits four days before he even goes there. 
And so we saw last time that when Jesus finally shows up, Martha comes to greet Jesus and says, Lord, if you'd have been here, my brother would not have died. And that's when Jesus tells her, listen, I'm the resurrection of the life. He who believes in me will live even if he dies. And he asks Martha, do you believe this? And she replies in verse 27, yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, even who comes into the world. So today we're going to see death, the last enemy, part two. Because when we face this last enemy, God wants to provide comfort for us. First of all, the comfort that others provide for us and the comfort that Jesus provides. So John chapter 11, verse 28, the comfort of others in death. When she had said this, she went away and called Mary, her sister, saying secretly, <clears throat> excuse me, the teacher is here and is calling for you. And when she heard it, she got up quickly and was coming to him. Now Jesus had not yet come into the village, but was still in the place where Martha met him. Jesus comes to Bethany, a couple of miles from Jerusalem. And Jerusalem is, as I said before, in Judea. It says that he comes secretly, and she tells him secretly. Why? Well, I think she tells him secretly because she knows that the Jews, John chapter 10 says that the Jews were wanting to stone Jesus for blasphemy because he claimed to be God in the flesh. And so the disciples leave, and they, when they heard the message about that, that um, Lazarus had died, Jesus says, we're going over there, and it, the Apostles were like, for what? They were trying to kill us. Why do we want to go there? And Jesus says, listen, there's 12 hours in a day. My father has work for me to do. There's only so many hours. This is part of my work going over there right now. I'm on my father's timetable. Nobody can touch me unless my father allows it. So they take off for the village. And so that's why I believe he might have been told it secretly because they're afraid the word's going to get out and the Jews are going to come find Jesus there and try to kill him before his time is due. So Jesus shows up, verse 31. Then the Jews who are with her in the house and counseling her, consoling her, when they saw that Mary got up quickly and went out, they followed her, supposing that she was going to the tomb to weep there. They were consoling her. The word has the idea of comforting her, encouraging her. And this is not the first time. Earlier, when Jesus first gets there, John eleven nineteen, 19, and many of the Jews had come to Martha and Mary to console them concerning their brother. Now, they come there because they knew Martha and Mary, and they knew their brother had died. I think when a loved one of yours dies, you just wish the world would stop. Everything would stop, and you'd wish, hey, I, I am hurting here. Life is hard right now. And it's not that people don't care, but they still have their lives. They still are going, you know, however fast they go. They still have other responsibilities. But it sure is nice when somebody consoles you. When somebody takes time out of their schedule. Because I believe that there's something special when people come together and bring human comfort to those who've lost a loved one. But let's face it. It's hard at times, right? Some of you said that right now, huh? Yeah, I don't know what to do. Why is it hard? Well, because we feel nervous because we don't know exactly what to say. We don't know how to comfort somebody. We don't know, you know, how to express our sympathy. The comedian Woody Allen said, showing up is 80% of life. A lot of truth in that. You just show up sometimes. You don't know what to say, you don't know what to do, but you go because that's what you know you should do. And sometimes we think we have to say something profound, something deep, something theological. No, you don't. 
just by going, touching the bereaved person, maybe holding his or her hands, putting your arm around them. I'm sorry. Listen up. Again, showing up. Doesn't have to be anything profound, anything great. Now, having said that, I think some comfort people can give to others is greater than other people. For me, I don't know what it's like to lose a spouse. I don't know what it's like to lose a child. I've never been in either one of those places, but many of you have. And hopefully you found comfort. Paul says this in 2 Corinthians 1.3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our afflictions so that we may be able to comfort those who are in any affliction with the same comfort which we ourselves are comforted by God. <clears throat> so, when you've been through something and you hear somebody else going through it, you now, if you've been comforted by God, which hopefully you have, you now have an insight into the pain of loss that that person is going through. So if God's comforts you, you go and you comfort others. I think one of the greatest pastoral verses in all the the New Testament is found in Romans 12, 15, and he says, Rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those who weep. Boy, is that nice. You share in people's joys. You share in people's grief, and you do it by just showing up sometime. Man, I'm glad for you, or I'm so sorry for you. Verse 32. Therefore, when Mary came where Jesus was, she saw him. And fell at his feet, saying to him, Lord, if you'd have been here, my brother would not have died. <clears throat> she knows of all people, if possible, Jesus could have prevented Lazarus dying. She'd probably seen miracles he'd performed. She'd heard about him. And again, just like we saw last time, I don't think she was saying it in a harsh way to Jesus, but just like, Lord, I, I know if you'd have been here, things would have been different. You'd, if you'd have just showed up, things would have been different. Listen, Jesus knows when you're going through stuff. He's a man of sorrows acquainted with grief. So if everybody, it's awesome to have people around you when you need comfort. But I think the greatest comforter is Jesus. Because he knows the depth of your pain more than any other person can. So let's see the comfort of Jesus when we deal with the last enemy, death. Verse 32, 33. When Jesus therefore saw her weeping and the Jews who came with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in spirit and was troubled. Weeping, the word here for weeping is a loud wailing, a sobbing, uncontrollably. And so what's Jesus' reaction? He was deeply moved in spirit. It literally means he groaned. There was an emotional indignation that was happening at this. When Jesus saw her sobbing and the others sobbing, he was deeply moved in his spirit, I believe, it says right here, to the point of anger. Of what caused this? Angry at death. And not only was he deeply moved in his spirit, it was, he says he was troubled. He was <clears throat> agitated. He was stirred up. He was disturbed within. In the ancient world, this term was used of the snorting of a horse, you know, just this rearing of a horse, this fury of a horse. That's the picture of Jesus right here. And literally what it means is it, not so much that he was troubled, but it, it literally means he troubled himself. He voluntarily identified with the sorrow that sin and death had caused. We see right here this remarkable unveiling of Jesus' heart of who he truly is. 
He now st stands face to face with the last enemy, death. And he is angry to see the ruinous damage of this. It affects everybody. Nobody gets a free pass. Nobody. And so, because we live in a, a sin-fallen world, the greatest pain we have experienced is the loss of a loved one. But in that, I say to you, Jesus knows exactly how you feel. This is why Jesus went to the cross. You know, we talk about sin. We know about sin. We've, you know, first-hand experience, all of us. But Jesus knows it as great as anybody because he saw what took place back in the garden and how sin has affected everyone. And so he willingly, voluntarily, lovingly went to the cross to pay the penalty for sin, to, to take the punishment of sin upon himself to satisfy God's justice. And in doing so, when he was crucified, what happened? Darkness, three hours over the face of the earth. He cries out, my God, my God, why has thou forsaken me? Jesus, is the, at that moment, knew separation, loneliness, more than any person can ever imagine. He'd been with his father in this love relationship from eternity past. And now, in some unfathomable, mysterious way, though he never ceased being God, he became a sin offering, and the father had to turn his back on the one he loved dearly. So because of that, Jesus, when you feel that, he knows. He knows the intensity of it, the pain of it. But the thing about Jesus is, again, the good news, three, that death couldn't hold him. Three days later, he came out the tomb to show, to demonstrate he was victorious. Satan had bruised his heel, but he crushes Satan's head. And he will one day completely vanquish the last enemy, death. Verse 34, and he said, where have you laid him? They said, Lord, come and see. Jesus wept. Show us verse in the Bible right here. Now, this is totally different than the word for weeping for Mary and the Jews. That was wailing. That was sobbing. This is uh, quiet. Tears were just rolling down his face. He was totally brokenhearted, but he was not out of control. See, Jesus is not some distant deity like the Greek gods, you know, up on Mount Olympus, and, you know, the affairs of man are down here and there above the fray. No, not Jesus. He sees the tears of the grief-stricken and is moved by compassion. And Jesus wept because he was truly human in every sense of the word, truly divine, truly human. He was not controlled by artificial intelligence. He was like we are. And because he was human, he had real human friendships, as we see right here with, with uh, this family. He was stirred by human emotions. He was not ashamed of his human weakness. He was not afraid to become part of human afflictions. And he could not bear to see the grave and its corruption. It moved him. It stirred him. And let me put this forth to you. Perhaps Jesus might have been weeping also for Lazarus. We know he was weeping for the sisters because he knew Lazarus would have to come back. He'd have to come back and die again. Let me paraphrase these three verses right here, 33 to 35. When Jesus saw Mary wailing and the Jews with her wailing, he was moved with anger. He troubled himself and wept silent tears. Real sympathy for Jesus. See, a Savior who never wept would never be able to wipe away my tears. 
your tears. But he can, because he knows. And so if you ever want to know how Jesus feels about funerals, how God feels about funerals right here, the death of a loved one. He's not overjoyed. Again, God in all his ways, he's a God of justice, but he's also a God of mercy and compassion. He's a God who is grieved over the, over the death of the unrighteous. So Jesus groans right here. He's angry right here because of what's taking place. Verse 36. So the Jews were saying, see how he loved him. But some of them said, could not this man who opened the eyes of the blind man have kept this man also from dying? All who knew Jesus, all who saw Jesus, knew Jesus' love. Well, we're not sure if Jesus really cares. No, if you saw Jesus... You knew he loved people. And even his skeptics right here. Some of these were probably skeptics. They were cynical. Man, why couldn't he do that? If he says he's, he's so great, why couldn't he keep Lazarus from dying? If he thinks he's God. They didn't question his love. They question his power. Now, the answer is, of course Jesus could have kept him from dying. The question about God's acting is never one about power, God's power, but it's always about God's purpose. Why didn't God just save Lazarus from dying? Well, the text gives us two reasons. Because not it was a matter of power, but a matter of purpose. Verse 4, chapter 11, when Jesus had heard about Lazarus' sickness, he tells his apostles, uh, this sickness is not unto death, but for the glory of God, that the Son of God may be glorified by it. Listen, God's purpose was that he was going to do something incredible, which he does, and God's going to be magnified. He's going to be glorified. Another reason, he tells them in uh, verse 15, I'm glad Lazarus is dead for your sake, that it was that I was not there so that you may believe. The second purpose was that the disciples, that, that faith needed to be strengthened. And Jesus knew this. So he had the power to do it, but it was for God's glory. It was for their faith to be strengthened. And I'll add to that, Martha and Mary's faith to be strengthened also. So Jesus didn't heal him right away. Verse 38. So Jesus, again, being deeply moved within, came to the tomb. Now it was a cave and a stone was lying against it. So Jesus said, remove the stone. Martha, the sister of the deceased, said to him, Lord, by this time there will be a stench, for he's been dead for four days. Second time it tells us that he was deeply moved, emotional indignation, this anger that he had. Now he comes actually where Lazarus is, is, the tomb is, in the cave. And I love the way the King James Version says this. It says, by this time he stinketh. Now, I don't know what happened to the soul of Lazarus in this four-day period. Scripture doesn't tell us, so if it's silent, I'm not going to make speculation, but here's what I can say. Lazarus, wherever he was, whatever state he was in, was safe and secure. He was doing fine. Verse 40. Jesus said to her, Did I not say to you that if you believe, you will see the glory of God? So they removed the stone. Then Jesus raised his eyes and said, Father, I thank you that you've heard me. I knew that you always hear me, but because of the people standing around, I said it, so that they may believe that you sent me. Jesus gives this public thanksgiving. He and the Father were always one in purpose, always did the Father's will, but he makes sure he thanks the Father publicly so everybody knows. It's a witness to who he is. It's a witness to God's power. So he does this so that they might believe. And after he raises Lazarus, it says many of them did come to faith after this great miracle. Verse 43. When he had said these things, he cried out with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. 
The man who had died came forth, bound hand and foot with wrappings, and his face was wrapped around with a cloth. Jesus said to them, unbind him and let him go. A loud voice. Now, listen, this loud voice wasn't for Lazarus to hear. I've got to make sure Lazarus hears me so I better shout. Now, the loud voice was for all those present. Again, we don't know how many people were there. I mean, there must have been the word got out. There must have been a crowd. This guy, Jesus, is coming to the tomb. He's going to raise Lazarus. I mean, you can imagine that. So I wanted to make sure everybody in the crowd knew as he prayed first, and now he's going to call Lazarus forth. And as it's been said, if he wouldn't have said Lazarus, everybody in the tombs would all come forward because Jesus had the power to raise the dead. Jesus gives this command and the power to accompany it. R.C. Sproul writes this. His divine word of command echoed to the depths of Lazarus' tomb, penetrated the grave cloths, and brought life where there was death. The moment the voice of Christ called on Lazarus to come forth, Lazarus' heart began to beat again. Nerve impulses began to race through his body. And his rotten, putrefying flesh became whole and healed. Lazarus was alive. How did he come out? Did God kind of just transport him out? He's all bound up. Did he kind of hop out and kind of wiggle around? I don't know. But the main thing is, he's been dead for four days. He was thinking, but he is alive. Now, let me just kind of take a little sidebar here because I want to compare Lazarus, what happened to him when he came back from the dead and what happened to Jesus because they're, they're quite different. First, it's resuscitation versus resurrection. Lazarus and the other six that the Bible records who were raised from the dead were resuscitated. They were clearly dead and they were revived, Okay. Jesus is the only one who has resurrected from the dead. He came back. The other seven came back with their same old bodies. Well, I don't know how old they were. One, let's say Lazarus was an old man. He didn't come back you know, with a brand new fresh body like he was young again. He came back with the same old body. And so did all those who were raised from the dead. But Jesus was resurrected. He came back with a glorified body, similar to his old body, but different. Perfect in every way. He's called the first fruits because all who belong to him, all believers, one day will also get a new, glorified, perfect body, incorruptible. Lazarus has got to die again. Jesus Similar but different, never had to die again. So resuscitation versus resurrection in its truest sense. Second, the tomb. Lazarus, both tombs were open for different reasons. Lazarus' tomb, the stone rolled away to let Lazarus out so everybody can see that Lazarus, who was dead, is now alive. Jesus had the same thing. A stone rolled away from his tomb. Why? To let Jesus out? No. To let people in. To see Jesus is not here. Jesus, in an instant, when he rose from the dead, he was out of the tomb. But everybody had to come see. He's truly alive, risen from the dead. So the, the closed tomb. So we have resurrection versus resuscitation, the tomb, and then last of all, the grave clothes. Lazarus comes out. He's bound. Think of of a mummy. And he's got this wrapping that probably went around his head like this to kind of hold his jaw in place. Is that how Jesus came out? What about his grave cloth? Well, John chapter 20, verse 7 tells us. Well, actually, beginning with verse chapter 20, verse 6, it says that, 
Simon Peter enters the tomb, and behold, the linen wrappings lying there, and the face cloth which had been on his head, not lying with the linen cloth, but rolled up in a place by itself. In other words, Jesus' mummy wrappings and his face cloth had just like whoosh, fallen to the ground by gravity when he rose from the dead. Just like they were. Perfect place. Why? Because he was gone. He was alive. He didn't have to come out bound and somebody to loosen him. He was past all that. So, so similar things, but different between Jesus and Lazarus. Now, let me close with this. Death is the last enemy. Jesus has defeated it. How? Two things. First, spiritual death has been defeated for the believer in Christ. See, the raising of Lazarus from the dead is a perfect illustration of a sinner when they're born again. Lazarus was raised from the dead by the power of God. He was called by God personally. Jesus alone gave him new life, and then he responded by faith. He was set free from his earthly grave cloths and started to walk new again. Every one of us are spiritually like Lazarus. We're physically alive but not spiritually. We're all spiritually dead, Ephesians 2.1. And you are dead in your trespasses and sin. Now, all lost people are spiritually dead. Nobody's more dead than another. You go to a you know, morgue, there's 25 people, dead people there, they're all dead. But some people are more decayed than others, more corrupt than others. That's how our world is. Everybody's dead. Some are more further away from God, more corrupt, but we're all dead. We all need life. And Paul says in Ephesians 2, 4, but God, love that contrast, being rich in mercy because of his great love, which he loved us, even when we were dead in our transgressions, made us alive with Christ. By grace, you've been saved and raised us up with him and seated us in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. You were dead spiritually, but God, through Jesus, raised you from the dead. At your appointed time, Jesus called your name personally and called you out of the graveyard. He made you alive. He gave you new life. Why? By grace you've been saved. Unmerited favor, nothing you could do, nothing you could earn. You heard the gospel. God quickens your heart and you respond to it and you embrace it by faith that Jesus died for your sins. For by grace you've been saved through faith, not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works that any man should boast, Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. And so then this sudden instantaneous change takes place deep down in your soul. Your sins are taken away. God gives you a new heart, a new nature. The Holy Spirit comes to indwell you. A change takes place. And now you still got grave cloths, but you begin to walk. You begin to walk differently now. You begin to discard some of those old fleshly ways, those old grave cloths, and you begin walking daily with Jesus. Paul says in Ephesians 4.1, walk in a manner worthy of the calling which you will have been called. Because you're different now. There's a new life in your soul. A new nature. Just like Lazarus. Physically, but for the believer spiritually. The raising of Lazarus is a glorious picture of what Jesus has done for every believer. He's called you from spiritual death and made you alive together with him. And one day, he's going to give you a new glorified body, just like Jesus had when he came out of the tomb. Until that day comes, we should walk in newness of life. We should walk in awe of such love and power and grace that God would shed upon my corrupt self. So the first thing about Death, the last enemy. Jesus has conquered it for every believer. Second, second thing. 
as you pass through the valley of death, as a loved one of yours is no longer on this earth, Jesus is with you. He provides comfort and sorrow over the death. He sees your grief-stricken heart and knows all about it more than anybody else even on earth can because he's been there and even further. Hebrews 4.15 For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses but one who's been tempted in all things as we are yet without sin. Therefore, let us draw near with confidence to the throne of grace so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Jesus is a merciful, caring Savior. He sees your valley of tears. He knows your heartache. And he calls you near to him to draw near the throne of grace in your time of need. He knows the pain of death like no one else can. I close with the words of Leon Morris commenting on chapter 11 of John. He says this. Through the centuries, this story has brought comfort to the people of God as they contemplate death. It is not that they expect the miracle to be repeated. It has not been. But it shows that our Lord stands in a relationship to death very different from that of our own powerlessness. Knowing that he has the power over death and those who believe in him will never know the full horror of death gives believers confidence and calm in the face of their last enemy. That enemy has been decisively conquered. Let's pray. Lord, we, uh, we praise you for just this incredible passage of Scripture, one of the most profound, moving in all the Word, to show Jesus who he truly is, not just some nice teacher, not a good neighbor, but truly a man of sorrows acquainted with grief a compassionate Savior, a loving Savior, a Savior who calls people to himself, come all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. He particularly calls us to him to find comfort and rest when we lose a loved one, the greatest pain anybody can ever have. But Lord, um, We know that death, as horrible, as awful, as ugly as it is, will one day be completely vanished. Jesus will take care of it all. It's the last thing he does as we go into eternity. But until that day comes, Lord, we're still on this earth, all of us, walking, still trying to walk out of these grave clothes. None of us never get completely free of them. But help us to walk in newness of life. Help us to walk in hope. Help us to walk in compassion for others. Help us, Lord, to to know our Savior more and more. And as we know him more and more, we praise him more and more. So thank you, Jesus. Thank you, thank you for all that you are and all that you've done. Amen.